Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hereditary Disease Foundation's Research Spotlight webinar that will recap findings from the recent biennial symposium. Oh, apologies. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Hernandez. I'm the director of the research programs for the HDF. And if there are members of the audience that aren't familiar with the Hereditary Disease Foundation, we are an organization that funds research to develop treatments for Huntington's disease, as well as other brain disorders. I want to start by thanking our sponsors, Sage Therapeutic and Spark Therapeutics. And I am particularly excited about today's webinar because I was able to invite my friends and colleagues to serve as our panel of experts with whom I'll be recapping the HDF 2022 Milton Wexler Symposium. And together today, we're going to dive into what some of the data that was presented at the conference means for the field of HD research. We recently met with 250 of the world leaders in the HD field in Boston in late August, and we gathered to share scientific findings and discuss the newest theories in the field of HD research. There were also several firsts at this conference. For the first time, we were able to hold the Young Investigator Forum, where HDF-funded young investigators met a day ahead of the conference to share their research, uh, to network with each other, and to have roundtable workshop style discussions about big questions, not only in their own research, but also in the HD field as a whole. And this was really exciting because these young investigators have been meeting via Zoom for quite some time because of the pandemic. And so this was the first time for many of them to meet each other in person. And this was even the first time for some of them to have a live meeting at all. So this was a really, really exciting and big deal. This was also the first time that the conference had coverage from HD Buzz. HD Buzz is an online periodical that writes about HD related scientific findings uh, and news in plain language for the global HD community. And I serve as an author and editor for HD Buzz. So I was really excited to be able to sit uh, front row and tweet live tweet the event for the very first time. And if you're interested in learning more about um, some of the summaries of the talks, you can go to hdbuzz.net. Uh, today, with a panel of our HD experts, we'll be discussing some of these findings from the conference, um, and I'll be sharing a conversation uh, about the symposium with Dr. Michelle Gray, and Michelle is from the University of Alabama, uh, Alabama at Birmingham, where she's an associate professor in neurology. Michelle trained in one of the top HD labs in the world with Dr. William Yang at UCLA, where she helped to develop a mouse model that's very commonly used in the field. And her work with that mouse model has really helped to define how cell types other than neurons are contributing to the pathogenicity of Huntington's. And Michelle has emerged as a true pioneer in understanding how these non-neuronal cell types are contributing to Huntington's. And she'll be sharing her expertise in that arena today. We're also joined by Dr. Ryan Lim, who's the Director of Biology at Modulo Bio Inc. and works in the lab of Dr. Leslie Thompson at the University of California, Irvine. Ryan has been at the forefront of using single cell technologies and has a really deep expertise in both genomics and systems and computational biology applications. Ryan has used his skill set to get a better understanding of how Huntington's progresses in various cell types, and he's going to be contributing his knowledge on single cell techniques today. We are also joined by Dr. Ricardo Moro Pinto from Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School where he's an instructor of neurology. <clears throat> Ricardo trained in the lab of Dr. Vanessa Wheeler, where he's really helped lead the charge in understanding the contribution that both DNA repair and somatic instability plays in Huntington's disease. Uh, his work is characterizing what these changes mean, not only for Huntington's disease, but also other diseases um, to identify potential therapeutic targets. And so somatic instability has been a really hot topic in HD research as of late. So Ricardo will share his expertise with these mechanisms. So I'd like to start by thanking each of you for participating today. I'm really excited to be able to share the discussion um, about the conference with each of you and look forward to an exciting conversation. Uh, before we get into the specific talks from the conference, I want to take a step back and make sure we're all on the same page by going over what we know and what we don't know about Huntington's. And so what's interesting is that every single person has the Huntington gene. Um, and within that gene, we all have a stretch of CAG repeat tracks. So this is a repetitive CAG DNA sequence. 
If someone has 35 or fewer CAGs in this gene, they will not develop Huntington's. But if they have 40 or more, uh, they will develop Huntington's disease within their lifetime. And it's this CAG repeat tract, the expanded version of this, that codes for an abnormally long version of the protein that misfolds and wreaks all sorts of havoc in the cells and in the body, basically. And so some of the most prominent effects that are seen in Huntington's are seen in the brain. Uh, particularly, we see a shrinking of the striatal region in the very center of the brain here, as well as a thinning of this outer cortical layer known as the cortex. Um, and so what's really interesting is that the number of CAG repeats that someone has within their Huntington gene correlates at the age at which someone will experience symptoms, which is shown here. And so we have the number of CAG repeats along the bottom, this x-axis, and then the age at which these people started to experience symptoms up going up and down on the y-axis. And so we find that the number of CAG repeats that a person has, the younger they'll get the disease, whereas the fewer they have within the disease threshold, the older they'll get the disease. Um, but even though we know these things, there's actually a lot we don't know about Huntington's. And so these are some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Uh, the first that we'll go over are other cell types in HD. And so when people think of Huntington's, they typically think of the brain and neurons because these, this is the organ that's most affected and this is the cell type that's most affected. But the Huntington gene is actually expressed in every single cell type in the human body. And so researchers are now beginning to understand that there are effects associated with the disease outside of the brain and in other cell types other than neurons. And so we'll be going over um, what some of these effects are and how they might be contributing to disease. Uh, we all know that research, or sorry, that technology is advancing just at absolutely breakneck speeds um, and research advancements are no different. And in the last five or so years, there have really been advancements that have gone leaps and bounds in something called single cell technology. And we'll discuss what those are and how we can use these techniques and technologies to better understand Huntington's. DNA repair and somatic instability or somatic expansion <clears throat> has been a really hot topic in HD research in the last several years. And you might've heard about this. So this is when the CG repeat tract tends to get bigger over time in certain tissues. And so there's a theory that this could be contributing to disease progression and a lot of the symptoms that we see in HD. So we'll talk more in detail about uh, what somatic instability is and how a family of proteins and genes involved in DNA repair can be involved. And so this webinar is set up so that I'll give a brief introduction to, to the audience about each of these topics. I'll go over some of the talks from the conference that related to these, and then I'll ask our panelists to weigh in on some of these questions. And then we're going to finish with a question and answer session from the audience. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and then our panel of experts will answer those. Uh, we've also enabled the chat function. So if you have just general comments that you want to tell us, like how great we're doing, uh, feel free to use the chat function for that, but please reserve the Q&A box for um, questions. Okay, so we'll start by discussing other cell types in HD. And as I mentioned, um, people very typically think of HD as a brain disease because that's where we see the most prominent effects. And we also see the most prominent effects in neurons. Uh, so this cell type here, um, this is the primary cell type in the regions of the brain that are mostly affected. But Huntington is expressed everywhere. It's expressed in your heart, it's in your liver. Um, and so what does that mean for Huntington's? We heard quite a few talks at the conference that detailed the effects of Huntington's and cell types other than neurons. So other cell types other than the brain. And one of those talks was given by Dr. Balji Koch that looked at the contribution that the expanded version of the Huntington gene has in two specific cell types, in neurons and in astrocytes. And so when people think of the brain, this is the cell type they usually think of, the neurons. These are the, the information messengers within your brain. They're sending chemical and electrical messages, not only between different areas of your brain, um, but also different areas of your body to communicate. Um, but these astrocytes, the star-shaped cell, are actually one of the most abundant cell types within the brain, and they work by supporting neurons. What researchers are finding is that these astrocytes as Huntington's disease progresses, change both their shape and their function. Um, but what researchers don't know and what has become a really hot topic in HD lately is if those changes in shape and function mean something for the disease or if they're just reacting to changes that are caused by the neurons. And so this was a question that Ball got at in his talk. 
Um, and he did this by lowering only the expanded copy of Huntington and either neurons or astrocytes, and then asked how each of these cell types are contributing to disease. And so really this is a two-part experiment um, where he lowers expanded Huntington only in astrocytes and then looks at the signals given from both neurons and astrocytes. And then the second part, he lowers expanded Huntington only in the neurons and then looks at the response from both neurons and astrocytes. And so overall what Ball found was that by lowering expanded Huntington in the neurons had larger improvements than when expanded Huntington was lowered in the astrocytes. And so really the take home message from that conclusion is that the neurons are the major driver for disease. And even Ball said, this was kind of to his own surprise, right? Like this was kind of contrary to what he would have expected to have found. And I thought this is an interesting system. And I wanted to ask Michelle, because I know you're an expert in glial cell biology. Um, what did you think of his findings? And is this what you would expect from what he reported? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So as you may know, we, we also tackled this question some years ago ourselves using a different um, animal model and somewhat different techniques. Nonetheless, uh, what we found actually, I think is very similar to what he's observed. So one thing I didn't remember or don't remember from his talk was um, how uh, extensively he looked over time in these animals when he lowered the Huntington or mutant Huntington um, in astrocytes or neurons. And so, but what we found is, is, is in agreement with this really. Um, so our lab and, and maybe me specifically, we believe that astrocytes are not necessarily initiators of the disease pathogenesis in Huntington's disease. We believe that they're contributors to disease. So as the disease progresses with the presence of the mutant Huntington in these astrocytes, they are causing more severe disease. So while they don't start it, if you only have Huntington in these cells, it may not be the same as having Huntington in neurons and glia and astrocytes specifically here. But if you have it over time, they can make your disease worse. So we're not necessarily in disagreement with his work. I think he's right. And, um, and I think this is you know, sort of what I've been um, trying to put forth as well. But I do think they're important cells to target because if you can target those cells and then slow disease progression, uh, then I think that would be a bit, uh, beneficial um, in general to HD. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a super interesting technique. It really allows, you know, balls up, and I know you're doing something similar to get at what are the specific cell type contributions. And I think that's a nice segue into another talk I want to highlight from the conference, which was by Dr. Michelle Gray. Um, and so since we have the expert here, I'm not going to pretend to like give Michelle's talk, but I do want to just set up the conversation by briefly going over what she talked about at the conference. And she talked about her work in astrocytes. So again, that star-shaped cell that with a neurotransmitter called GABA. And so neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that work to control the functions in our body. And you've probably heard of some of these, right? Like there's serotonin, which is our happy hormone. And there's adrenaline, which gives you that rush when you're on a roller coaster. Um, and GABA is also a neurotransmitter. So GABA works by reducing the excitability of nerve transmissions, which basically means it reduces the ability of a nerve cell, like a neuron, to send and receive messages from other cells. And so Michelle reported at the conference work that she did where she reduced Huntington and astrocytes and what she found in mice. And what she found was that there were improvements in the signs and symptoms of Huntington's. And one of those was the changes in levels of GABA. And so I wanted to ask Michelle to briefly go over this work, but also to talk about what she think, thinks this means about how astrocytes are communicating with other cells of the brain, particularly neurons. Thank you for that, Sarah. So this line of research is really interesting. And so this is uh, a lesson that science teaches us. So we really did not anticipate seeing this result. So this was very surprising to us and required me um, and my lab to do a lot, a deep dive into the literature. And basically what we found um, that was not unknown to gliobiologists, but what we found was that these cells are really important cells and not just regulating glutamate that we in our field commonly think about, but also important in regulating GABA. And so we had seen this change in GABA levels in the mouse model that we use. And then we started to think about um, when we reduced Huntington in the astrocytes, we saw a sort of restoration or normalization of this GABA level. 
So we started to really try to think about how are these astrocytes and these neurons communicating to change GABA level. And so we think that there are some um, proteins that are in the brain that are altered in HD that are really responsible for taking up this GABA. And those proteins are localized largely, um, they're found in neurons, but also um, one specifically is found in glia. So what we think is happening is that when mutant Huntington, the presence of mutant Huntington in these astrocytes alter the expression, alters the expression of these proteins that are responsible for taking up this GABA. And in so doing, it changes the communication between these astrocytes and neurons. Therefore, as Sarah, uh, you alluded to, the way these neurons function changes. And we believe that a change in this function could really contribute to some of the uh, clinical manifestations that we see in Huntington's disease, perhaps motor as well as some of the cognitive changes that we see. That's really interesting, right? Like, and it's these types of experiments that really let you ask and answer questions that are kind of chicken and egg, right? Like what's coming first and what's the cause and what's the effect. Um, and I also know, Michelle, you have uh, studied effects outside of the brain, right? Like you have HDF funding to look at how Huntington's is affecting the heart, which I think is really, really interesting. Could you tell us a bit about what you're finding there? So thank you again for that. So this is work that, uh, as you said, we recently got funded for to really study whether um, patients, uh, HD patients had um, cardiac abnormalities. So there has been some evidence uh, in the literature to suggest that indeed HD patients have cardiac changes. Um, however, uh, studies that really were prospective, that really tried to take uh, um, an unbiased approach just to assess do HD patients really have cardiac dysfunction really had not been done um, before. So, so we're doing this uh, early, what we call observational trial, where we just look at how the heart is functioning in Huntington's disease uh, patients and, and normal people as well. And so, so far what we found, um, we're, we're still in early stages, but what we found is that some of these patients indeed have what we call rhythm problems. So how the heart is beating, um, how, how fast or how slow the heart is beating. So some of these um, uh, Huntington's disease patients indeed have problems with that. Now, we hope to, of course, we can't um, do tests and do all sorts of studies and manipulations in HD patients. We hope to use our animal model that also shows some of these very similar cardiac changes that we see in HD patients. We hope to use our model to manipulate the mutant Huntington expression in the heart as well as in the nervous system because the nervous system also contributes to how the heart beats. Um, I don't know if everyone on the call um, on the webinar will, really appreciates that. And so we hope to really as assess, does the brain or does the nervous system really cause the changes that we're seeing in the heart? Or is it really because of the heart cells themselves expressing the mutant Huntington um, resulting in these cardiac phenotypes that we see? So we're excited about this work. Um, and hopefully next year, we'll be able to tell you guys a little bit more about the results that we're obtaining. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can pick this conversation up at the Q&A, but I have a lot of questions, right? Like we don't want to cure Huntington's in the brain and then have people have massive heart problems later. So this is a really important area of study. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to our second kind of area of coverage, which is advancements in single cell technology. And so uh, you can think of tissue analysis like sand on a beach. If we look at a sample of sand from one location altogether, it appears quite similar. And the same would be true if we took sand from other beaches. If we looked at it within its own like sample, it would be quite similar, but we would only start to really see differences when we compare sand from other locations. And this is really how tissue analysis works. This is like bulk tissue analysis. But if we were to look at individual grains of sand from a certain one of these places under the microscope, we would really start to see that each grain of sand is slightly unique. Um, rather than being a collection of identical grains of sand, each grain is maybe a shell fragment uh, or a little shiny spiky rock or something. Um, and this is like single cell analysis. Uh, while some of these are similar, um, there are really some that are quite different. And single cell analysis really lets us pull this out. And so 
Um, this type of technique allows us to look at a sample within the brain and see what certain cells and even subpopulations of cells are doing to get a really rich source of information. And so this is a technique um, and set of techniques that has really just really taken off over the last several years. And it's allowed researchers to ask and answer incredibly sophisticated questions. And there was a talk at the conference given by Dr. Miriam Hyman, who described data from a recent publication that her lab put out in the journal Nature. And she used single cell techniques to look at the cerebrovasculature from the brains, human brains of people with HD. And so cerebrovasculature is basically just the blood vessel system that runs through our brains the way that it runs through any part of our body. So if you look at the back of your hand, um, those types of vessels are also going through your brain. Uh, and this brain vasculature is made up of various cells that make something called the blood brain barrier, which you might have heard of. And this blood brain barrier is contributed by largely these cells shown in pink. These are called endothelial cells. And they have this cobblestone like appearance that lines the vasculature and they're very tight together and they form the barrier properties of the brain. And what's interesting is that in Huntington's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, there's a breakdown of this barrier. And that's actually observed before neurons start to die and before there's any cognitive impairment. And so one of the questions that Miriam's work wants to get at, if there's a causative link between this breakdown and what the implications might be for various diseases. So um, Miriam discussed her results that looked at differences in the vasculature of the brains of people with and without HD. And she was able to identify certain genes and pathways that might be participating in this breakdown. And what she showed was that there seems to be a loss of something that has been termed cell identity at the molecular level. And recently in the field with the advent of these new single cell technologies, we've been hearing a lot about this concept of quote cell identity um, and how Huntington's could contribute to these changes in the identity of the cell, particularly as the disease progresses to later stages. And so Ryan, I was hoping you could use your expertise in single cell technology um, to tell us a bit about this concept of cell identity and how it might be contributing to Huntington's disease. Yeah, sure. So first off, I just want to thank Sarah and thank HCF uh, for having me on and everyone that's participating as well today, uh, too. This is really important work to be highlighting. Um, so yeah, the easiest way that I can explain cell identity, um, and this is work that's coming out of uh, Leslie's lab, William Yang's lab, and a bunch of other individuals, including Megan Hyman, that have noticed this. Um, and what we're noticing is that when you think of a cell, right, so you think of like a neuron and an astrocyte, those are some of the two main cell types that are in the brain, but every little individual region of the brain and even the astrocytes and neurons that are surrounded by really different compositions of cells surrounding them, they're going to have a unique identity to them. So even though these um, cell types can still be identified in the HD brain as either being a neuron or an astrocyte, let's say, their unique genes that make up their specific function in that very unique region of the brain or in, the, in that region of the brain, but even you know, proximal to unique cell types, um, those are actually being lost. So we see a down regulation or a decrease of all these genes, which we would call cell identity genes. And so when you look at like a mean spiny neuron as an example in the stridum of an HD patient, um, we can still tell that it's a neuron, right? It looks like a neuron, it's expressing genes that, that are, are common to all neurons, but the genes that make it a medium spiny neuron and function like one are being lost. And so we're trying to study why that is and what changes molecularly are causing that loss of identity in these cell types. And then ultimately how that impacts function. And then if we can actually rescue that for all these different cell types that we're studying in the brain using this technology. It's interesting and it's something that we haven't been able to get at, right? Until these technologies have advanced to this point. Um, and something else that I really wanted to get your take on, Ryan, was Miriam presented some newer data where she showed she specifically reduced Huntington only in these endothelial cells, so only in these pink cells. Um, and she showed that there was suppression of HD-associated behaviors in HD mice, so specifically Rotorod for the scientists in the audience. Um, and I thought this was fascinating for two reasons, right? Like, number one, this is a relatively small population of cells in the brain. So to reduce Huntington in this population of cells and have an effect, that alone was impressive. Um, but also, number two, this is not a cell type that people typically think of 
as drivers of disease. And I know, Ryan, you published one of the first stem cell models of the blood-brain barrier using Huntington's disease. And I was hoping to get your take on this. What do you think about this? And do, are you surprised by these results? Um, so, yeah, not, not super surprised. I would say, I think that, you know, and this speaks to kind of what, you know, Michelle has shown and uh, some of the other work that's been highlighted already. I think that, you know, even though we think that the neurons are the most um, impacted and, you know, maybe very important to the causal um, pathogenesis of the disease itself, all these different cell types in, in the body and especially in the brain are contributing towards the disease. And so um, if we can think about it in terms of trying to, you know, help patients, I think that any research that's being conducted to study any of these cell types, if it can move the needle, it's something that we should be focusing on, right? And so whether this is astrocytes or uh, the blood-brain barrier and vasculature. And so I think that targeting the blood-brain barrier, um, it, it's it's an area of study in, in you know, uh, neuroscience that has actually a, a, a lot of individuals working on it um, for different neurodegenerative diseases. And so this feature and this, uh, this functionality of the endothelial cells in the brain uh, are really, really important for neurogeneration and uh, contributing towards it, and even um, in some cases are causing. Uh, so this, the result isn't super surprising to me. I mean, I think that uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that someone has has thought of targeting them specifically to see if there was any therapeutic uh, effect. And I'm glad to see that there is. And so it's just one extra avenue where us as researchers, we may be able to move the needle a lot on that over other types, other cell types in the body. And so I think it's really important that individuals like Mayhem are, stu are continuing to study the, the vasculature and the blood-brain barrier. Yeah, I agree. It's fascinating. And it's also, it's a lot easier to access, right? Because you're at the pre-barrier stage. These are cells that directly come in contact with the blood. So if we can get some sort of therapeutic to them and they can have a major effect in the brain, that would be super cool. Yeah, it would be much easier to target those yeah. cells than deep into the other brain tissue. So yeah. So another talk I wanted to highlight was given by Dr. Steve McCarroll. And this talk was fascinating for several reasons. Um, but one of the reasons I thought this was so interesting was because he used single cell analysis to look at a pretty large number of human brains. He looked at 95 different patient brains. 50 of those were from people without HD and 45 from people with HD. And he used a technique that was developed in his lab called DropSeq. And basically what it, it does is it uses molecular barcodes to label individual cells. So these little spiky things coming in on the end is a barcode. And then the cells come in from the top and the bottom and they're paired in this nanoliter sized drop together and then they can be analyzed. And so once these cells are labeled and analyzed, Steve can pull out information from specific cell types or specific genes he's interested in and ask how the expression of those genes is changing in these certain cell types over time. So super interesting and super duper cool. Um, and so some of the questions that Steve asked with this technique were around the role that the Huntington gene itself is playing in disease progression. And so one of those questions was, um, if Huntington levels help to explain the vulnerability that we see in certain cell types, like we know neurons in the striatal region of the brain are very vulnerable in HD. Um, and so is it expression of the Huntington gene itself that's leading to this vulnerability? And what his data seemed to suggest was no, that there's no evidence to indicate that Huntington is explaining this vulnerability. But then the question becomes, then what is, right? Like we know the Huntington gene is causing Huntington's disease. And if it's not the gene itself that's leading to this vulnerability, what is causing that vulnerability? And so he then asked questions about the CEG expansion. And I'll talk more about this in the next section, but really for all you need to know for now is that the CEG expansion gets larger in some tissues over time. And the thought is that maybe this could be causing the vulnerability. And so Steve asked questions surrounding this, and he looked at specific cells and subpopulations of cells that are particularly vulnerable to ask if it was the CEG repeat expansion that's underlying that vulnerability. And what he found was that yes, in fact, it is. Um, and so this was actually quite a provocative talk since it seems to suggest that it's not Huntington itself that's driving cell vulnerability, but rather the CEG expansion. And so Steve concluded his talk by asking the audience to consider these what ifs, right? Like what if it isn't Huntington driving the toxicity, then what is? 
And I think one of the points that Steve was trying to make was that he was trying to get this audience of HD experts, of HD scientists, to think about HD in a different light, um, to challenge how we've been viewing the cause and effect of what this disease is. So I'd like to open this up to any and all of the panelists, because this is quite a provocative um, thought process that he was sharing. Um, what do you guys think this means for current approaches? And should we be reconsidering how we're designing treatments moving forward? So whoever wants to take this first. I'll take this. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the, for the invitation. For me, this was clearly um, uh, a, a, this is clearly a landmark study. This this was uh, the best um, talk we, we had at the, at the meeting, from my personal point of view, and how how it can um, motivate us to start looking at this really from a different uh, perspective. Um, it's clearly showing that because looking at all these patients. Uh, the end stage brains clearly seeing that the loss is uh, of cells is specific to a uh, a neuronal population, and the ability to link it to the to the length of the CAG and mm -hmm. showing that CAGs are expanding specifically in those cells, it has to make us start thinking about it from a, a different perspective. And then the ability also to link it to expression of genetic modifiers. I thought that was also extremely important. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the interest of time, we'll transition there, because um, I think that's a nice segue into our next segment, which is DNA repair and somatic instability. And so we tend to think of our DNA is a perfect blueprint that codes for who we are, but DNA is actually constantly being used and like things that are constantly being used, um, it needs to be repaired. And there are molecules within our bodies that act to repair DNA, which are very aptly named DNA repair proteins. And so these are a set of proteins that repair the DNA when something goes wrong. But sometimes there can be mistakes, uh, like maybe this little orange segment is added. And those mistakes tend to be added when there's really long repetitive sequences of DNA. And so you can think of this like these two houses. If I were to ask you to make a perfect drawing replicate of both of these houses, you would have a lot more trouble trying to copy the very detailed one, right? Like it's just way more difficult. And so the same is true for DNA. When this cellular machinery comes in contact with very complex and repetitive sequences of DNA, that's when mistakes tend to happen. And it's something that you can think of as a molecular stutter. Um, and so the CAG repeat tract, which I have highlighted here uh, within the Huntington gene, is, tends to be very complex because it is so repetitive. And this is an area where the molecular machinery can cause those molecular stutters and increase that. But what's interesting is this really only occurs in certain tissues. Um, blood tends to be very stable. So if you have a CAG repeat analysis when you're 20 years old and your expanded allele is 42, it's very likely when you're 60, your expanded CAG will still be 42. But researchers are finding that there are certain tissues like the liver and the brain where the CAG repeat is incredibly unstable and there tends to be these expansions over time. And so this is an image from a technique that's used in the lab to look at CAG repeat sizes. Uh, so we have different areas of the brain on the bottom of the blot and then the number of CAG repeat sizes going from top to bottom. And it looks like this person had about 20 CAG repeats in their non-expanded allele, but they had 51 for their expanded. Um, and what we start to see is there are certain cells where we see these really high bands um, indicating that there are certain cells within these regions of the brain, particularly the striatum and the cortex, which are very vulnerable, that have massive expansions, up to 700 in some cases. Um, but what does this mean in the context of HD when you see these really large expansions? So I mentioned at the beginning that the CAG repeat size correlates with age at onset. So the higher CGs, uh, CAG number you have, the younger you're likely to get the disease. Um, but there's actually quite a bit of variability uh, with the number of CAG repeats. And so these people represented in red got the disease about 10 years later than expected, and those in green about 10 years earlier. And if we were to look at um, the expansions within the brains of these people, we might expect to see that those that got the disease earlier had a lot of expansions and those that got the disease later had few expansions. And um, 
Researchers are now thinking that this is likely due to very small changes in their DNA repair proteins. And so if we correlate DNA repair proteins to a hammer, um, it's likely that these people that have a lot of expansions have a very average hammer uh, that's causing these molecular stutters, causing a lot of expansion. But the people that have very few expansions might have a great hammer, like Thor's hammer. Uh, and this is really preventing those molecular stutters from occurring, keeping those contractions smaller and reducing the, the age at which they start to show disease. And so this has been a really hot topic in HD research because it's thought if we can understand this and if we can control this, perhaps we can just push the age of onset back, hopefully past a normal human lifespan um, and really help people with HD. And so there was a talk at the conference given by Dr. Vanessa Wheeler, who focused on this, on DNA repair and somatic instability. And Vanessa has really been a pioneer in studying this topic. Um, and she's been at the forefront of understanding what DNA repair and somatic instability means for Huntington's. And so there was a very large scale study done that looked at DNA from many different patients that have Huntington's. Uh, and they identified genes that modify the age that those people got Huntington's, and they found that they were associated with DNA repair. Um, but these very large studies are kind of coincidental, right? They're just looking, you got HD later, what's unique about you? You got HD earlier, what's unique about you? They're not testing a hypothesis, but that's what Vanessa's work is doing. She's testing this hypothesis. She's looking at how expression of these certain DNA repair genes um, changes. And so she did this experiment using a technique called CRISPR, where she changed expression, she reduced expression of all of these DNA repair genes in both the livers and the brains of mice, and basically is assessing, is this a very average hammer or is this a super great hammer? Um, and so what she found in one of the findings that she shared at the conference was that by knocking out expression of these genes, um, she found that some really suppressed the expansion of the CGRP, some enhanced the expansion and some did nothing at all. And so really she's been able to set out to do what she wanted to do, which was identify um, some of these genes and which ones are an average hammer or a really great hammer. Um, and so what I think is interesting is that this isn't something that's unique to HD. This is something that is seen in other neurodegenerative diseases, which Vanessa highlighted at the conference. Um, and so perhaps if we can identify and really get a hold on some of this in HD or another disease, we can apply that to the other one. And so now Vanessa and her team are testing different combinations of these genes to see how that works. And so I know Ricardo trained in Vanessa's lab, so he's very familiar with this work. And I was hoping, um, Ricardo, you could talk a bit about tissues other than the brain. Uh, a lot of the treatments right now that are going through the clinic are really focused on CNS delivery. Um, but what does it mean that we see CAG repeat expansions in these other tissues like the liver? And should we be opening up um, our our how we're trying to target Huntington's to a more systemic approach. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm extremely biased in, in this case, <laughs> Vanessa being my mentor. And uh, this particular project was uh, uh, my uh, HDSA Berman Topper Fellowship. Um, so uh, in, in regards to other tissues, um, we've looked in a variety of other peripheral tissues from uh, HD patients. And the liver is really the, the only one that displays somatic expansion. So all the other peripheral tissues are mostly stable. Um, it's known that HD patients have metabolic uh, issues, but we've never really studied uh, the liver and uh, any implications that may exist from having uh, accelerated uh, somatic expansions. But in this particular case, the, we use the liver sort of as a proxy of what's going on in the brain. We know that it's expanding uh, through similar mechanisms. And uh, in mice, uh, it's much easier to perturb or to target the liver and uh, study these, the function of these genes in the liver uh, than in the brain. So we're not, we weren't necessarily trying to understand uh, the contribution of these mutations to, to the disease in liver but simply to try to understand how these uh, proteins interact in repairing the CAG repeat and contributing to its expansion. I see, so do you think um, if there was no effect of Huntington's disease in the brain, do you think it would eventually be a disease of the liver? It's quite possible. Mm, interesting, okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of uh, the webinar portion, but I wanted to end this portion of the talk with a sentiment that opened up the conference 
And so on day one, we heard recorded remarks from Dr. Nancy Wexler, who is the president and one of the founding members of the Hereditary Disease Foundation. Uh, and Nancy really relayed a message of hope about the trajectory of the HD field. And she closed her statement by saying, a treatment for Huntington's disease is within our reach. And I found this particularly moving, um, not only because of the, the incredibly exciting research-driven science, like we've talked about today, that's being done in the HD field, but also because of the massive increase in clinical trials that we've seen. Um, and this has really been even over the last four years since the last time the conference has met. So it's been really incredible to see how much the field has grown in this respect. And we focused our discussion today on really basic research related to Huntington's, um, but the field has evolved into so much more than that using this basic research. At the conference, we heard eight talks from different pharmaceutical companies that are each moving their own drug forward in clinical trials. And there were many more posters uh, about potential therapeutics that are moving towards the clinic. And so to me, that really embodies the hope in the field right now and this basic research that has made the breakthroughs to lead the charge in that. And so to end, I would like to ask uh, each of our panelists to maybe talk about what they feel is the hope in the field right now and maybe what they see as the next big breakthrough in HD research. Wow, Sarah, that's a, that's a loaded question, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate that question. I think that, you know, really trying to uh, identify, you know, as Steve McCarroll's work clearly has shown, and I think uh, Ricardo's work in, uh, in Vanessa's group has also clearly shown, this CAG repeat expansion um, that seems to be very cell type specific, uh, especially for the medium spiny neurons, and I guess also for liver cells, um, is um, probably leading to uh, the very specific cell type vulnerability, right? And therefore um, leading to the very specific toxicity that we're seeing for these medium spiny neurons. Although we do recognize that other cells are also affected. Uh, so I think that, you know, while there have been some challenges in targeting uh, the expanded Huntington allele or, or Huntington itself uh, therapeutically, I still see this as an avenue uh, that should, should continue to be explored. You know, the hope is that, um, or at least in my mind, the hope is that um, alternative methods can also be identified that will enable us to um, control this expansion of the CAG repeat. Uh, and maybe some of these genetic modifiers that are being explored um, in Ricardo's work and, and Vanessa's work uh, will give us some avenues to intervene in Huntington's disease. So I do, uh, in a very real sense, agree with Doc, Dr. Wexler. I do think that we've made a lot of progress over decades, uh, really, right? Um, in Huntington's disease, understanding the molecular mechanisms at play, understanding really what cells we should target with specific therapeutics. And so I, I, I see the promise and hope in that area. But what I also caution though, is um, focusing only on that as a therapeutic intervention, uh, especially for those who may have um, um, sort of gone past the point of this being a, a true option for them. And so I think that the field, and I think we heard a lot of talks of, around um, other mechanisms that could potentially be targeted for treating Huntington's disease. And I think the studies to really understand molecular changes in specific cell types are, are really critical. And because this could lead us to um, identifying different uh, proteins, receptors, kinases, or anything that potentially could be targeted uh, to intervene in Huntington's disease. So I do think a, treat, a good treatment, uh, a neuroprotective treatment for Huntington's disease is on the horizon. Yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment, especially the last portion of it, quite a bit as well too. I think all this new research is um, fascinating and I think that it's gonna um, you know, be wonderful for moving uh, new treatments into, into clinical trials for HD. Um, some of the CRISPR uh, work that's being done, not in the HD field specifically, but um, you know, some of the clinical, clinical trials that are being done with CRISPR may also um, be really important for the HD field eventually too, if, if we can get some of those approved 
uh, for usage and in, in, uh, in human use and targeting in the CNS and things like that can be worked out. Um, but I also, yeah, I would just like to re reiterate what Michelle's saying is that all the other research that's being done and not really maybe highlighting a breakthrough thing for the field, but uh, uh, as far as like biology goes, but a breakthrough technique um, that's being used right now is um, spatial uh, related uh, uh, omic data analysis. And so analyzing whole brain slices uh, in order to study, you know, gene level expression, protein level expression, uh, metabolites, all these things that are, um, you know, uniquely being impaired or changed in a good way, even sometimes uh, at very specific regions of the brain and at very specific cell types of the brain. I think if we still continue to focus our research on that, we may be able to find something that, um, that again, can can maybe move the needle enough to the point where the age of onset is just, you know, so far pushed back. So, so still, so still targeting and 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 thinking about those those molecular, I guess more more classical molecular treatments or, or therapeutics that we could target um, specific proteins and genes in the in the in specific cell types would be something that we should focus on as well. And I think that the spatial related data is going to really allow us, really help us in order to be able to do that. Interesting. Do you want to add anything, Ricardo? No, I, I just think that, like, and that was represented at the meeting that you you want to focus on a variety of different uh, aspects uh, associated with disease, and I think it's critical that we we keep pushing uh, all these alternative uh, approaches and keep multiple um, multiple avenues open to towards therapeutics. Um, if if some don't work. Um, Something will. So it's that that concept of multiple shots on goal. I think I think that's important. I agree, and I think it's diversifying the portfolio of our shots on goal, right? And it seems like the CG repeat expansion is promising not only for Huntington's but for other diseases. So maybe uh, we can continue that conversation with some of the questions that people are asking. Um, and so someone asks, are the stability of CG repeats dependent on the cell life length? So we know that neurons are a really long lived cell and they have this high somatic instability. So is, is it because that these are post mitotic cells are not dividing that we see this somatic instability or do shorter lived cells have less instability than longer lived cells? Hmm. Perhaps for Ricardo there. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think, so obviously if, if, if something is prone to expand and, and it, and it uh, is around for a long period of time, um, you definitely see a greater degree of expansions. Um, I, I don't think they, it's necessarily related to how long that they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we know is that uh, there needs to be transcription so that the gene, the HDT gene needs to be active, um, but uh, I don't think it's necessarily um, just a, a matter of if it lives long, it will necessarily expand. You, you need uh, these DNA repair genes to be uh, active as well. Uh, the, there's a, a number of things that need to be in place for, for the repeat to expand. So perhaps related to that, and before I get to the question, I wanna remind people, put your, uh, your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll keep answering questions uh, until one o'clock rolls around. Um, but perhaps related to that, someone was wondering why are there certain tissues that are particularly vulnerable? Like why the striatum and why the liver? Why in those two tissues do we tend to see this, this somatic instability? We, we don't know a lot, but for example, data from, from Steve McCarroll's uh, presentation where he was actually able to look at expression of uh, different genes. So he has transcriptomics data from a single cell, a single cell level. And he was able to show that the cells that were more prone to expansion, medium spiny neurons, they also had increased levels of MSH3 and decreased levels of FAN1 uh, genes, which are known um, modifiers of disease onset and modifiers of instability. So uh, mm -hmm. potentially that, that could be a, a, an explanation why those particular neurons are prone to expansions, but this is still early stages in his analysis. I'm, I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to, to him generating more data so that we can get closer to that. Same, I, I think, think everyone was. 
Yeah, I think one interesting thing about those two unique regions of the body is that they're really highly metabolically active as well, too. And as you know, most scientists would know, and for uh, other lay individuals in the audience, when you have really highly metabolically active areas of the body, you produce a lot of um, uh, like molecules that can like damage the DNA. And so that also may be contributing in some in some fashion. I'm I'm not sure, but it would just be another another hypothesis at this point. So maybe I could use um, kind of the chair's initiative here and ask a question related to that. I've also heard uh, that perhaps sperm is a highly metabolically active cell type. And so is this why we see genetic anticipation when people inherit Huntington's disease from their mother versus or their father versus their mother? Am I opening a can of worms here? I don't know. This is like just something I'm curious about and interested in. Yeah, I mean, possibly, you know, I think that like, you know, again, I think at this point, it's just, you know, an idea and a hypothesis right now, but that, you know, it would make, you know, logical sense biologically with these, any area that's has really, is really highly metabolically active can be uh, impaired if there's changes in the DNA damage repair genes or um, mutations in genes that would ultimately affect those genes downstream. It's interesting to think about. Um, so maybe this next question I'll direct to, towards Michelle. Um, and so John Stevens is wondering, when we're talking about neurons and astrocytes, are there similar findings and information with other diseases? So diseases like ALS or Parkinson's, um, and is this shared across these diseases when we look at Huntington's disease? So this is a great question. And I do think that there, so the study of these non-neuronal cells that we broadly call them, so astrocytes is a type of uh, what we call glial cell in the brain. So I think that indeed there are probably similarities. Um, similarities, not the same, right? I think that there are, because these diseases are caused by different uh, mutations, uh, some of them known, some of them unknown, uh, especially for, um, for Parkinson's disease uh, and ALS indeed. Uh, I think that some of the mechanisms may be similar. These cells are affected in those diseases. Now, uh, to be honest though, many of the studies on these cells, um, there are not that many studies on astrocytes, especially in Parkinson's disease. There are many more on astrocytes and ALS. So there are similar uh, mechanisms at play. These cells I think are indeed involved. Uh, glial cells, broadly speaking, are involved in all of these neurodegenerative diseases. This is a question uh, for Ryan from Tacey Fox. I'll direct it towards Ryan, but of course anyone can answer. Um, but Dr. Hyman indicated with some of her diseases that the blood-brain barrier breakdown occurs before the de degenerative onset. Um, and she's asking if this has been validated in Huntington's, I'm assuming Huntington's patients yet. And if that's the case, would this be beneficial for enabling larger molecules of drugs um, to get into the brain? So, so yes, um, that, so yes, and that is very, um, that is an avenue that's being actively worked on to try and like, I guess, for lack of a better term, take advantage of that feature of the disease itself to allow for uh, drugs to penetrate into areas that may be more affected by the disease since they do have blood brain barrier breakdown. Um, I think that, you know, what what's, what's seen in the patients is not I wouldn't say it's it's like massive enough leakage so that we can get like any therapeutic into the brain that we would want, but there are not only not only is there general leakage, but what we found was that there are unique differences in certain genes that can actively transport molecules in and out of the brain as well too, and so I think that's a very you know great question and great idea, and I, I know that there are researchers that are actively working on trying to take advantage of the either the leakiness or just the differences in expression of those transport genes to try and get more drugs into the brain. This is with HD, but then also other neurodegenerative diseases in general as well, too. And I think maybe it's important to point out just knowing that there is a, a leaky blood-brain barrier and having models like the one Ryan created, right, like a stem cell model um, of the blood-brain barrier in Huntington's that we can use in the lab will allow us to ask questions about certain molecules and if they can get in and out or if they penetrate the H2 blood-brain barrier. Um, so having basic research and having in vitro models, models in a dish that allow us to ask and answer these questions is really important. 
Um, so there's a lot of interest in uh, the CGRP expansion, understandably. And so perhaps for Ricardo, um, you could answer this. Someone's interested in knowing why there are differences in CG repeat expansion in different types of neurons. So why is it that, that striatal neurons are particularly vulnerable to the repeat expansion, but for example, neurons in the cerebellum are not? Uh, yeah, so, so that's a very interesting point. Uh, and uh, I think something we're still scratching the surface on, on, on um, what those m mechanisms might be. Um, I think uh, the uh, advance of single cell um, transcriptional uh, data will help us understand that better. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's indications that some of these genes are altered in some of these um, cell types and uh, accelerating the, the rate of, of expansion um, specifically on those. But to, that data is still being generated. We, we only have it in a, in a subset of uh, of brain regions, and we'll just need to generate it throughout the, the brain. So we're coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah please, Michelle. Okay. I think that that speaks to the importance of us really thinking about Huntington's disease as a brain disease, broadly speaking. And I think it's important for us to, um, I think Ryan alluded to this, to do this spatial um, interrogation of gene expression changes and instability and, and, and proteins that are involved in DNA repair mechanisms across the brain. You know, maybe there are instances or areas in the brain where these, some of these repair proteins um, are expressed higher or lower and thus contribute to the change or the, the presence or absence of a repeat, of repeat expansion. Um, and so I think this, these omic studies, hopefully, um, um, more of them will be done in human tissue and um, will help us get at some of this uh, specificity as well. That's a really good point. Um, and so we're coming up on the one o'clock hour, and, but there's one last question um, where someone's asking about lifestyle. And I feel like this is a question that HD researchers get probably at every single conference or talk. And does lifestyle, the choices in your lifestyle accelerate or slow down HD? Um, and this is the super boring stuff that everybody knows and no one wants to really do. But yes, yeah, like exercise and diet make a huge difference in anyone's life. And so there have been studies that have shown that if you exercise and you take care of yourself, you're going to slow down the rate of Huntington's. Um, so just a plug for being super healthy and taking care of yourself because that's always important. Um, but I want to end by, first of all, thanking our sponsors, both Sage Therapeutics and Spark Therapeutics. Um, and then lastly, of course, our panelists. Thank you so much for participating today. It was really exciting to share this discussion with you guys. And as always, I'm very interested to hear what you all think about the latest in HD research. So it was really fun to get to do this with you. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our audience for tuning in. You can learn more about the Hereditary Disease Foundation, the research that we fund, and even to support our work by going to hdfoundation.org. And so I hope you'll all join us again for one of our next research spotlight webinars. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.